Thank you, Philippe. And thank you, Bob, and the organising committee for the invitation to do this keynote. And sincere regret that I cannot be there in person. So, as Philippe mentioned, my son had an operation on Thursday, so we were only out of hospital on Friday night, so there was no way I could get on a plane on Saturday morning to be in Austin uh, with the you this week. So I'm very sorry for not delivering this keynote in person. And I also it's very disappointed to be missing out on the excellent programme that Zach and the team have put in place uh, and meeting up with very many of you in person. But delighted Philippe and Bob have enabled me to deliver my keynote online. So thank you. So today I'm going to share some thoughts on whole life geotechnical design. What is it? What's it for? So what? And what next? Uh, but before that, a bit of context. So as Philippe mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm based and I'm talking to you now from Southampton on the south coast of the UK. So Southampton is a large port city and uh, the region has a wind turbine blade manufacturing base. So it's got a good maritime and offshore pedigree, although it's possibly most famously known as the port of departure of the ill-fated Titanic. So at the university, I'm based on the engineering innovation campus. Uh, and here is also the headquarters of the Pan University Multidisciplinary Southampton Marine and Maritime Institute, of which I'm one of the deputy directors. So my day-to-day -day engineering role is based at the National Infrastructure Laboratory on the same campus, uh, where we have some fantastic new geotechnical uh, laboratories, including a geotechnical centrifuge. And at the end of 2019, I was really honoured to be awarded a Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technologies to develop a group in intelligent and resilient ocean engineering. So working in Southampton is something of a circular journey for me as I did my PhD here uh, in the mid nineties. So I graduated with my PhD in 1998 and rejoined the University of Southampton again, nearly 20 years later. And during most of that time that I was away, I was based uh, at the University of Western Australia, working with the Centre for Offshore Foundation Systems. Of highlights of my time in Western Australia, certainly of considerable significance to me, is my role in the development of the ISFOG series. And really to reinforce that the best laid plans can always be disrupted, uh, like on this occasion when I cannot be in Austin with you all. Uh, my second child was born just five weeks before ISFOG 2, when I was chair of the organising committee. So this is really all just to share a bit of the context and the journey that has shaped the whole life geotechnical design philosophy that is the topic of my keynote paper and this presentation. And so before I start presenting the technical material, I'd just like to acknowledge a range of individuals and organisations that have contributed to the body of work that underpins or is directly reported in this story. So those from the World Academy of Engineering, Centre of Excellence in Intelligent and Resilient Ocean Engineering, or IRO, and the wider offshore and maritime colleagues at the University of Southampton, as well as international collaborators uh, scattered across the globe and in various roles in academia and industry, but many whom I met and built these relationships with when we were all at UWA. And to acknowledge the industry partners, some new and many established for more than a decade, who support the work uh, and inform it. And to the Royal Academy of Engineering, who support my chair and provide the opportunity for the development of the Centre of Excellence at the University of Southampton. So now on to whole life geotechnical design. And in this presentation, as in the accompanying paper, I'm going to touch on what is whole life geotechnical design? What's it for? So what? And what next? So what do I mean here by whole life geotechnical design? So in a nutshell, it, the philosophical basis of whole life geotechnical design is that design outcomes can be improved by considering the whole life actions and the resulting whole life soil responses. So the fundamental basis of whole life geotechnical design is the same as that for traditional geotechnical design, i.e. that a design action does not cause a design limit state to be exceeded. However, in whole life uh, design, this check is made repeatedly throughout the life of the structure or system, rather than just once for the worst case combination of maximum action and minimum resistance, as is generally the case for traditional ultimate limit state offshore geotechnical design. And for serviceability or fatigue limit states, the whole life geotechnical design approach recognises the stiffness or the rate of accumulation of movement is affected by previous actions. So this schematic illustrates the varying imposed actions and 
geotechnical response across the design life of an arbitrary hypothetical structure that underpin the philosophy of whole life geotechnical design. So imposed actions can cover a temporal spectrum, which may be short term events shown here, which may be undrained installation or an impact load. They could be longer episodes shown here that may be comprised of a series of those events. So a construction or operational processes, process or perhaps uh, an extreme weather event. Or there can be actions over the whole life of a structure. So periodic thermal events such as operational heating and cooling or ratcheting. And these events and episodes can be superimposed on that background of whole life actions in response to enable greater scrutiny of the specific activities or environmental influences. So considering this hypothetical time history of actions, it's essential to understand, for example, what is the source strength and stiffness at the start and end of episode B, which is shown here, uh, in order to be able to determine the true geotechnical stability of the structure during that of episode and then subsequently for future events such as C and D. So from the lower figure, it's clear that the design resistance for whole life geotechnical design, which is shown in green, always exceeds the current design action, which is shown in gray. While for a traditional approach shown in red, adopting the maximum action and minimum resistance across the design life, leads to the design resistance to fall below the design action. So violating the failure criterion which in practice would result in a larger foundation or anchor being required, increasing the challenges associated with installation and cost. So at the decommissioning stage, should the structure be removed from the seafloor, the whole life design approach enables a realistic prediction of resistance in order to determine the required crane or vessel capacity. While a traditional design approach would considerably underpredict the actual uplift capacity. And if it were proposed to leave the structure in place beyond the original design life, whole life geotechnical design can better inform on the stability of the structure for that afterlife. So the geotechnical concepts underpinning whole life geotechnical design are not new, and aspects of whole life geotechnical design are established in onshore practice, although perhaps without being named as such. So staged embankment construction and tailings dam design are based on whole life design principles with consolidation as a driver to improve resistance for a further stage of construction. In offshore geotechnical practice, there are examples of reliance on self-weight consolidation beneath the structure between installation and winter storm season, but as an exception rather than the norm. And whole life geotechnical design is really now emerging as a more widely applied philosophy to encompass approaches that improve design outcomes by predicting the evolving soil parameters due to the imposed actions during the design life. So what is whole life geotechnical design for? Well, the insights from whole life geotechnical response can be applied across and beyond the design life. At the initial design stage can be used for optimal sizing. Through life can be used for assessing or predicting cumulative displacements or changes in resistance and assessing assumptions that are made in the initial design against observed performance. And by extension, these insights can be used to predict the actual remaining design life for relifing or repurposing and decommissioning. So the soil responses causing changes in resistance and stiffness over time may be due to a variety of things, including consolidation due to changes in applied load, whether those are monotonic or cyclic, sediment transport, so it could be scour, erosion or newer phenomena such as ankyline seabed trenching, or cyclic strain, for example, ratcheting or densification under cyclic actions. And so why do we need whole life geotechnical design and particularly why now? So there has been an established offshore uh, sector for oil and gas for 60 or more years. 6,000 oil and gas platforms and structures have been installed in oceans globally and generally without much issue, suggesting offshore geotechnical design practices are OK. But the transition to renewables has seen acceleration of installations more in the last decade than in the 50 years before that. So designs must become more efficient or optimised and appropriate for the shift from bespoke individual platforms carrying crew and hazardous materials to developments of tens or hundreds of self-similar structures without crew or hazardous substances. So considering the outlook, just in the UK from where I'm based, there are various projections 
for offshore wind provision to 2050. The UK's six carbon budget sets out a range of different energy scenarios, indicating between 90 and 140 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050. This corresponds to a build rate of up to five gigawatts a year. Considering this in the context of the number of required turbines, there's about 20,000 turbines in 30 years, or about 650 per year, or two a day, just in the UK. Comparing that to about 6,000 oil and gas structures that have been installed worldwide in the last 60 years, so about 100 a year. So for our industry, offshore renewables just in the UK may convert to around 50,000 anchors, 50,000 kilometres of squared of seabed to be characterised at 100,000 CPTs to do our bit as offshore geotechnical engineers to avert the climate catastrophe. So this figure is from an anchor review paper that is being led by Benjamin Serfontaine from the University of Southampton, who is in the audience at ISFOG, so you can go and chat to him more about this uh, if you are interested. There are also challenges of where to put all these structures to deliver the necessary capacity and what the constraints are that exist over these much greater required areas of seabed. So we're carrying out another project at Southampton looking at existing and forecast constraints in terms of offshore wind farm development, whether those constraints are met ocean, ecosystem, geoscience or anthropogenic. And while the oceans are big, the most accessible bits can be quite congested or home to significant or endangered ecosystems or difficult met ocean or geoscience conditions. And there's a similar outlook in many regions. In this study, we collected a worldwide data set of offshore hydrocarbon and offshore wind infrastructure for the period 1960 to 2040. We've presented it on an interactive GIS map against the backdrop of offshore renewable and hydrocarbon resources. And it's freely available alongside the open access paper for users to explore. And the data shows the acceleration and the shifting loci of offshore activity in the coming decades. And the paper explores also some of the tensions of balancing the economic, environmental and social needs in the current regulatory frameworks. And of course, it's not just fixed and floating wind moving to the oceans, but a diversity of industries, including tidal and wave energy and cable networks for comms and power. And nascent or potential industries, including floating solar, open ocean aquaculture, uh, floating ports or energy islands, and even urban uses of offshore space for seasteading. And wherever all this infrastructure will be, it must be secured to the seabed efficiently and effectively via a range of foundation and anchoring systems and an understanding of the seabed response over the design life. And often, and perhaps increasingly so, in very variable geotechnical conditions. So this is an example of the Burbo Bank extension in Liverpool Bay in the UK. And just along one line of CPTs on a 10 kilometer section shown by the red line, you can see the variation in soil properties in the CPTs below. So just to recap, so we've had a look at what whole life geotechnical design is, what it can be used for, and why we need whole life geotechnical design now. So the general philosophy of whole life geotechnical design applies to all situations in which the strength, stiffness and other soil properties evolve over time in response to actions on the system. But the focus of this presentation is going to be on whole life geotechnical changes due to consolidation effects. So considering this figure again in the context of evolving soil properties from whole life shearing actions and consolidation, fundamental soil mechanics principles describe the mechanisms through which undrain monotonic loading of soft clay leads to increases in excess pore pressure and reduction in effective stress. And it's well established that undrained cyclic loading leads to softening due to a buildup of positive excess pore pressures and that consolidation, i.e. the dissipation of excess pore pressures and reduction in void ratio, leads to increases in undrained strength of the soil or hardening. And in sequence, these principles form the basis of whole life geotechnical design with consolidation as a driver. Now, softening of fine grain soils uh, from undrained cyclic loading has been observed in laboratory element tests and captured by pore pressure and strain contour diagram approaches for decades. But cyclic hardening is less well observed and captured. So these plots show cyclic softening and cyclic hardening observed in flow around penetrometer tests in a normally consolidated clay in geotechnical centrifuge tests. 
So on the left, the penetrometer is cycled at a specified depth continuously without the opportunity for drainage. And the reduction in penetration resistance with increasing cycles is clear. And in the lower plot, it is shown that the undrained shear strength in this case halves in the fully remoulded state compared to the initial intact strength. So with the test on the right, on the same material, the penetrometer is paused between cycles to enable dissipation of excess pore pressure, from which an increase in penetration resistance can be seen with increasing cycles. And the lower figure shows that in this case, the strength rose to three times the initial intact value. So this provides a very wide range of potential strengths to use in engineering design calculations and demonstrates the importance of using the appropriate resistance across the design life of a structure to ensure an effective, efficient design. And similar observed changes in soil properties, not just strength, but stiffness and coefficient of consolidation, have been observed for a range of boundary value problems. These are described in the literature. There are some examples in the paper, and I'll touch on a few in the coming slides. But for now, we need to move on to have a look at how to move from observations and measurements of whole life soil response to a design method. And this requires identification or development of the building blocks to capture and accumulate the individual processes and then a practical framework for identifying the necessary input parameters to any calculation tool or framework for the output. So I'm going to talk about a macro method approach based on critical state soil mechanics that can be used to apply whole life geotechnical design to a range of boundary value problems. So critical state soil mechanics is ideally suited to whole life geotechnical design with consolidation as a driver, as it relates changes in stress and excess pore pressure to changes in volume and hence strength, stiffness and coefficient of consolidation. So critical state soil mechanics is visualised in the ELMP and QP space as shown here. And for whole life or episodic loading with intervening consolidation, uh, this can be really captured uh, neatly, such as illustrated here on the right for the case of constant vertical load, shear to failure in each episode and full consolidation in between. And this can then be linked to the hardening or strength increase shown in the lower figure through the stress volume relationship. So the macro models discussed in this presentation of the paper adopt a lumped or a layered element system. So this is to create a simplified analytical model which applies critical state soil mechanics principles to lumps or layers of soil rather than individual elements. And this provides a generalised solution that is quick and easy to apply for preliminary design without needing finer element analyses. And it can be incorporated into a wider system model involving the structure using springs and sliders. So the figure here illustrates the different modelling concepts and a simple spring slider analogy for each system where the stiffness or the spring and the strength or the slider can evolve with time and loading history. So a lumped element approach shown in C here uh, applies the essential critical state framework to a region of soil, modified then by a scaling factor or a lumped factor to account for the non-uniform distribution of stress and void ratio change over the region governing uh, the changes in strength, stiffness and coefficient of consolidation. And this can be represented by a single spring slider as for a single element. And the general lumped element or macro element approach has been applied uh, for a range of boundary value problems, including a range of shallow foundations, and pipelines and also penetrometers. So a layered element approach shown in D here, that applies the basic critical state framework to soil layers to enable variations in soil properties with depth or stress level to be considered discreetly and then summed. So this is analogous to the odometer method of predicting settlement. And this approach can be illustrated as a series of spring slider systems in sequence. And this layered approach has recently been applied to frameworks for predicting changes in resistance and settlement of tolerably mobile subsea foundations. So considering the simple case of a shallow foundation under vertical loading, soft weight consolidation can lead to doubling of the initial undrained strength close to the underside of the foundation and then decreasing with distance from the foundation. The question is then how to determine the operative shear strength that will govern foundation performance under the subsequent load path. So results from a suite of finite element analyses investigating the effect of relative preload, degree of consolidation and over consolidation ratio 
show consolidated undrained vertical bearing capacity of stripped and circular surface foundations can be predicted by a simple lumped element critical state model, where the increase in capacity can be described by a simple linear function of known parameters. So R, the normally consolidated undrained strength ratio, SU over sigma dash V, VP, the applied preload or the self-weight of the, the foundation and structure, and NCV, the vertical bearing capacity factor for the undrained unconsolidated conditions. And F sigma and FSU are the stress and strength factors that account for that non-uniform distribution of stress and void ratio change over the region. And this approach has been extended to multi-directional loading of skirted suction buckets and mud mats, enabling multi-directional consolidated load capacity to be predicted based on this simple expression, which holds for different load paths just through that scaling factor, F sigma FSU. And in this case, we've applied the same fundamental critical state soil mechanics macro model to lateral breakout of pipelines following post-installation consolidation. And you can see comparing the inner pink envelope uh, to any of the outer ones, the effect uh, of the installation and post-installation consolidation on breakout resistance. So moving on to the layered element model, uh, this example considers a tolerably mobile foundation. So that is a foundation that is engineered to slide across the seabed in response to the thermal expansion and contraction of the attached pipelines. And here we can see on the left how different self-weight and period of consolidation across the design life affect the evolution of settlement. And to the right, the changes in sliding resistance and undrained shear strength that accompany those changes in volume that are responsible for the settlement um, are clear. And here, the figures on the right, they compare observations from centrifuge model tests with a simple critical state soil mechanics based macro model uh, that see, is seen to predict changes in soil strength, sliding resistance and settlement very well. And just to note that this framework has recently been extended to another soil type and also to incorporate the development of the berms that develop at each end of the foundation during sliding and consolidation. So it's been carried out by a recent PhD graduate, Chen Ching Jia. So look out for some papers uh, on that. So what does all this mean for design outcomes? So this example shows that the required foundation area come more than half by considering just self-weight consolidation prior to multi-directional loading. And this is shown as the actual footprint for various durations of consolidation on the left, and as minimum foundation footprint versus consolidation time on the right. In this uh, graph, we can see how whole life geotechnical design can inform on the uplift resistance for decommissioning at the end of life showing for this example that retrieval resistance may be six to ten times greater than the self-weight. And this is important to know to select appropriate vessel and crane size for removal or to inform on the stability for the afterlife of a structure if it is being left in situ beyond the design life. And this slide shows that whole life geotechnical design using tolerably mobile foundations leads to further reductions in required foundation size which is shown by the inner green outline on the left. Just a quarter of the area compared to a traditional design method for a static foundation shown by the outer black outline. And the method additionally enables prediction of through life settlement as shown on the right. And in the last couple of years, I've been involved in applying the layered macro element approach for tolerably mobile foundations to bundle system technology for a North Sea project. And in the figure here, you can see one of these bundled towhead structures being launched. And it's been really great working with Sub C7 to bring whole life geotechnical design and the tolerably mobile foundation framework into their design practice for this technology. So just to recap again, we have had a look at uh, the what, what whole life geotechnical design means, the what's it for and why it's needed and especially now. We've had a look at the theory underpinning the fundamental building blocks of whole life geotechnical response and development of macro models for preliminary design calculations. And the so what, the applications to various boundary value problems and the impacts on design outcomes. And so to wind up, I'm going to take a look at the what next. So what is next? What is needed to enable whole life geotechnical design 
to be adopted routinely. And so there are a few examples coming up in the next few slides, but key enablers can be broadly categorized as the need for site characterization, so practical protocols for deriving the necessary input parameters, action definition, so ways to define whole life actions, and then measure or monitor those actions to continually improve definition. Usable calculation tools need to be developed and made accessible so engineers can use them and inform on the refinement. Verification via field data is essential to build confidence in adopting whole life geotechnical design. So the community needs to come on board and collect and share performance data. And for widespread adoption, formalization of guidance is needed. So incorporation in international standards. And I'm just going to mention progress in a few of these areas in the next slides. So first site characterization. So at the start of the presentation, I touched on flow around penetrometers and for all of their excellent applications, they're an expensive way to characterize whole life response and they can only capture softening or hardening following shear to failure. So recent work at the University of Southampton has been exploring the use of DSS testing in the laboratory to characterize whole life geotechnical response under pre-failure, episodic monotonic and episodic cyclic sequences with intervening consolidation between those loadings. And these plots show how the, the soil properties evolve uh, with those cycles of loading. And here we're looking at the strength and the coefficient of consolidation. So this current work is being carried out in collaboration with the uh, Norwegian Geotechnical Institute and Nor Laham, the PhD student, is currently in Oslo uh, carrying out tests with Yusuke Suzuki and the team. So new design methods are also needed. So methods need to be developed to capture the response for a wider range of geotechnical boundary value problems than what I've presented just today. So for example, those lumped and layered macro models presented in this paper and presentation they're well suited to conditions in which a representative stress state can be reasonably estimated, such as for shallow foundations or pipelines or other near surface infrastructure. But for embedded structures, the representative stress state is not so straightforward to define and therefore deriving the effective stress state to define, to define the changes in void ratio is not possible. So in this situation, a critical state inspired approach can be adopted by proxies of damage or softening and hardening to represent excess pore pressure generation and change in void ratio respectively. So I presented a keynote at the Indian Geotechnical Conference at the end of 2021, in which I explore some of these advances in whole life geotechnical design methods. And you can read that paper open access at the URL here. And design methods need to be access accessible. And this can be facilitated through, for example, the freeware web apps that I host, well, the web apps developed and hosted by James Doherty and Mark Randolph at UWA. So tools such as these allow users to easily familiarize themselves with calculation methods, carry out design calculations, and quickly assess sensitivity of input parameters on design output. And I want to take this opportunity just to let you know that version two of my freeware web apps is coming out soon. And some key improvements are the inclusion of the whole life geotechnical design sliding foundation app, and a batch calculation tile in each app. So moving on to formalization of guidance. So key and recent advances in this area include the change of mandate for the suite of ISO SC7 standards, which includes increasing the scope of standards to offshore renewables and other low energy applications. And alongside this development, new and advanced methods that capture the essence of whole life geotechnical design are incorporated in the revised 19901-4. So the disk ballot has just closed for that and hopefully will be published in the first half of next year. So looking forward, so the oceans are being industrialized and unprecedented pace and scale to answer that abundance that is necessary that Tyson was talking about in his talk. And technology and geotechnical engineers have a vital role to play. So if Efficiency and optimization of geotechnical design is essential to enable the offshore renewables transition necessary to support decarbonisation of the global energy sector. And whole life geotechnical design has a role to play. But we should focus our minds on not just what we can do to deliver the competing demands of a growing population and reduced CO2 emissions, but also on ensuring that we do this as responsibly as we can. Using technology to monitor and model the impact of our interventions on the oceans at this scale 
to inform better decision making going forward. And for some thoughts on these topics, you can take a look at these couple of articles. And so to, cl- oh, so to close, I would just like to acknowledge again the team and the Centre for Excellence for Intelligent and Resilient Ocean Engineering, IRO, the wider group of maritime colleagues at the University of Southampton, international collaborators, particularly those whose work I have showed in the paper or presentation today, the Royal Academy of Engineering, who support my chair in Emerging Technologies and Intelligent and Resilient Ocean Engineering, and the ac- academic consortia and industry supporters of the work of IRO. And finally, thank you all for your interest and attention.